As most of you know, our Lenten season started this past Wednesday evening when we had our first Wednesday evening Lenten service. And our, our theme this year is we're looking at the last words that our Lord spoke from the cross. And uh, this coming Wednesday, we'll be having Sue Gainley that will be sharing with us on the second word that Jesus spoke to the thief that was to his right and told him that he would be with Jesus in paradise. In order to complement our Lenten services, uh, I've decided to preach between now and uh, Easter on different encounters that Jesus had while he was on this earth, different people that he dealt with and see what we can learn. And so our text this morning is uh, an interesting text. It's taken from John chapter eight. And it's a text that has been somewhat controversial over the years. And uh, you'll see what I mean once we start getting into it. We read in verse 1 of chapter 8, But Jesus went to the Mount of Olives. At dawn he appeared again in the temple courts, where all the people gathered around him. And he sat down to teach them. The teachers of the law and the Pharisees brought in a woman caught in adultery. They made her stand before the group and said to Jesus, Teacher, this woman was caught in the act of adultery. In the law, Moses commanded us to stone such women. What do you say? They were using this, to, this question as a trap in order to have a basis for accusing Jesus. But Jesus bent down and he started to write on the ground with his finger. When they kept on questioning him, he straightened up and he said to them, if any one of you is without sin, let him be the first to throw a stone at her. And then again, he stooped down and he wrote on the ground. At this, those who heard began to go away one at a time, and the odor ones first until only Jesus was left with the woman still standing there. Jesus straightened up and he asked her, he says, woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? No one, sir, she said. Then neither do I condemn you, Jesus declared. Go now and leave your life of sin. Let us, let us pray. Our gracious Father, we ask you to speak to our hearts as we look at this passage and try to discern how it relates to us and where we are living right now. And let us understand, Father, what your message is, what it was intended to be by inserting, having this particular story included in our Bibles. And so anoint this time with your Holy Spirit we ask in the name of Jesus, amen. Just uh, before our text this morning, in the seventh chapter of John's Gospel, I mean in Luke's Gospel, uh, no, in John's Gospel, <laughs> yeah. I'm studying Luke in the, uh, the uh, the adult class on Sunday morning, so I, I, doing that, and that gets me a little confused sometimes at this point in my life. <laughs> okay. At any rate, uh, John tells us how the temple guards, those were the, kind of like the soldiers of the temple, they weren't from Rome, they were uh, hired and paid by the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, and uh, at any rate, John tells us how the temple guards were sent out by the chief priest and the Pharisees to arrest Jesus. 
And we're told here that they came back empty-handed. And the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, they snapped, why didn't you bring them in? And sheepishly, these temple guards answered, no one ever spoke the way this man does. And then they snarled at them, you mean he deceives you also? Nicodemus, who had gone to Jesus one night, kind of secretly to ask him about the kingdom of God, he was part of that group, not in attitude, but in presence. And uh, he says, well, doesn't, uh, doesn't Jesus deserve a hearing first before he's arrested um, to see whether or not he has stepped outside of the Mosaic law. And because Nicodemus was, in a sense, defending Jesus, they lashed out at him, are you from Galilee too? And then as John tells us, they abruptly ended the meeting and each one went to his own home. However, sometime during that night, it seems, they got together without the presence of Nicodemus. And they hatched a plan designed to undermine Jesus' credibility before the people. And this is what our text is all about this morning in John chapter 8. Uh, F.B. Meyer, who was a well-known Baptist preacher during the 1920s, he was involved with inner city mission work and he was known for preaching strongly against dr drunkenness and immorality. He is said to have brought about the closing of hundreds of saloons and br broth brothels. In light of this, he once said something that many Christians today possibly would agree with. He said, it's a terrible thing for a sinner to fall into the hands of his fellow sinners. It's a terrible thing for a sinner to fall into the hands of his fellow sinners. Our text this morning talks about such a situation. It's a story about Jesus and a woman who had fallen into the hands of her fellow sinners, for she was caught in the very act of adultery by them. The story, in fact, is so popular that even those who really read the Bible know about it. It contains a statement that all of us have heard or perhaps have voiced ourselves at one time or another. He that is without sin, let him cast the first stone. How many of you have ever said that? Yeah, most of us, right? As we approach this story, it's important to note that there is some question about where it should be placed in our Bibles or if it should be placed in our Bibles at all. Most modern translations note that the entire story is absent from many of our oldest Greek manuscripts. Looked at historically, it seems that some church fathers commented on it and some Church fathers weren't even, weren't even aware of it. Now, be that as it may, I'm attracted to a statement that St. Augustine made about this story about 1,600 years ago. He said that some scribes, while copying the New Testament, omitted this story because it seemed to make Christ too lenient toward the sin of adultery. This certainly seems to echo F.B. Meyer's statement that it's a terrible thing for a sinner to fall into the hands of his fellow sinners. Now when all is said and done, most textual critics today agree that this is an authentic account of a true encounter between Jesus and this woman who was caught in adultery and therefore 
it should be included in our Bibles. In verse 1, we are told that the night before this incident took place, Jesus went up to the Mount of Olives, which is just across the Kidron Valley, and you have to climb up this hill, and it's a very beautiful spot to overlook the city. And we're told that Jesus went up there the night before this incident took place to pray and to rest. Uh, this was his habit, for as our Bibles tell us, he had nowhere to lay his head. And so that's where he often slept, was up on the Mount of Olives. In the morning, as the sun began to rise, he made his way down from the Mount of Olives across the Kedron Valley into the city gate that led into Jerusalem and then into the temple courts. And as soon as he arrived in the temple courts, a crowd quickly gathered around him because he was known to be quite a popular speaker. John tells us that he then sat down which back then a teacher would do when they were going to teach, they would sit down. And so he sat down and he began to teach. Now the Feast of Tabernacles had just come to an end the day before, which meant that great crowds of people were still in Jerusalem. Now as Jesus begins to teach, he is suddenly interrupted by a commotion that is taking place in the back of the crowd. A group, group of men are pushing their way through the crowd towards Jesus, dragging with them an embarrassed woman. And when they finally reach Jesus, they shove her in front of him and brazenly they say to him, Teacher, this woman was caught in the act of adultery. In the law of Moses, we are commanded to stone such a woman. Now what do you say? What do you say? Who were these men? John tells us that they were the religious leaders of Israel, the teachers of the law and the Pharisees. These were men who were well educated, well known, they were men who were reputed to be men of wisdom and high moral standards. If anyone had a question about the law of Moses or the Old Testament, these were the men who had the answers. However, although they were religious in the sight of the people, these men, as we see from the text, were not spiritual. That is, they were not godly men. Their motives on this day make that very clear to us. As the story unfolds, we discover that they are proud, that they are arrogant, that they are ruthless, that they are cunning, that they are calculating, and that they are thoroughly hypocritical. Now some other questions also arise that we cannot answer. Who was the woman? We don't know. Was she a teenager? Was she a middle-aged woman? We don't know. Was she married? Was she single? We don't know. And how did they catch her in the act of adultery? Again, we don't know. Right from the start, something fishy seems to be going on here. Rabbinic law was very specific about those caught in adultery. Since adultery was technically a capital offense, the law demanded that any accusation had to come from two eyewitnesses. It would not be enough to say that, well, we saw them entering a motel and then we saw them leaving. That, that wouldn't work. It had to be more detailed and more precise than that. Again, as John tells us, they said to Jesus, Teacher, this woman was caught in the act of adultery. In the law, Moses commanded us to stone such a woman. Now, what do you say? 
And so the question that arises in our minds is, how did these men happen to catch her? Was there a hidden video in the room? We don't know. And then the crucial question is, well, where is the man? I mean, adultery by definition requires two people, does it not? It's not likely that the man somehow managed to escape, but the woman didn't. And this causes us to wonder, could this have been a setup? Could they have paid that man into seducing this woman so that they could catch her in the act? After all, things like this still happen today in our own world. As the succeeding verses make clear, these men didn't care one hoot about this woman. If this was a setup, they have already caused adultery and apparently would be willing to cause a murder as well. So great was their hatred and their dislike of Jesus. And one final question is, why did they expose her publicly? There's no need for that. And there certainly was no need to bring her to Jesus to be judged. Clearly, they weren't seeking simply to punish her. Something much more sinister was at work here. These religious leaders could not help her. They could only condemn her. They could not give her a new heart, nor could they give her a new life. They could not set her free from her life of sin. They could condemn her, but they could not redeem her. They could destroy her, but they could not restore her. To Jews at this time, adultery was a terrible sin punishable by death. In fact, the rabbis taught that a man should take his own life rather than commit adultery or idolatry or murder. Evidently, this woman is truly guilty, for nothing in our text suggests her innocence. And the Pharisees would hardly have been as so dumb as to have hauled in an innocent woman before our Lord. Therefore, we can conclude that she was indeed caught in the act of adultery and was rightly condemned of a serious sin according to the law of Moses. And so the question is, what were these religious leaders up to by dragging this woman before Jesus? What they were up to is the hope of impaling our Lord on the horns of a dilemma. They referred to the law in the book of Le Leviticus in which God, speaking through Moses, had said that adultery was to be punished by stoning. Now, they knew that Jesus was a friend of sinners. They knew that he was always on the side of the unfortunate and that he spent his time not with the righteous or the 1%, but with the publicans and the tax collectors and the sinners. They obviously believed that he would not sentence this woman to being stoned to death, but would rather try to set her free. And if he did that, then he would be contradicting the law of Moses. And then they were, would be able to lay, label him as a false teacher of someone that did not have credibility when it came to the Old Testament scriptures. Now this scheme might have worked with an ordinary man, but they were not dealing with an ordinary man. They were dealing with the Son of God. And we should underline once again that these men did not care one hoot about this woman. To them, she was simply a tool. She was not a person to them, but rather she was the bait with which to trap Jesus. 
They humiliated the woman. They profess respect for the law of Moses. They claim to protect public morality. And they prof profess to want Jesus' advice. But it was all a sham, an attempt to discredit Jesus as a true teacher of God's word. As the Apostle John tells us in the sixth verse, they were using this question as a trap in order to have a basis for accusing Jesus. <clears throat> and so the question is, what, what is Jesus going to do? Well, in the second part of verse six of our text, John tells us what Jesus does. As he puts it, he says, but Jesus bent down and he started to write on the ground with his finger. And when they kept on questioning him, he straightened up and he said to them, if any one of you is without sin, let him be the first to throw a stone at her. And then he stooped down again and he rode on the ground. At this, those who heard began to go away one at a time, the older ones first, until only Jesus was left with the woman still standing there. Now there are some times when I read the Bible that I, I wish we had a little more information. What did Jesus write when he stooped down? Twice, what did he write on the ground with his finger? This has intrigued scholars down through the ages. There have been many guesses. In the Old Testament book of Jeremiah in the 17th chapter, there seems to be a possibility of what he wrote. Here in the 13th, 13th verse, we read these words. O Lord, the hope of Israel, all who forsake you will be put to shame. Those who turn away from you, their names will be written in the dust because they have forsaken you, O Lord. Because of this verse, some believe that Jesus wrote her accusers' names in the dust, Joe. Jimmy, Henry, whatever. <laughs> Nothing personal, Henry. <laughs> More than one writer has suggested that he wrote the names of their girlfriends in the dust, which of course does have the advantage of explaining why they cleared out so quickly. However, after all the speculation is over, we simply don't know the answer as to what he wrote. And in the end, it doesn't matter. If God wanted us to know, he would have taught us. What does matter are the words that Jesus spoke to them. If any one of you is without sin, let him be the first to throw a stone at her. Jesus' words are meant to remind them of the seriousness of their charges. In essence, what he is saying is, before you pick up a stone, take a good look in the mirror at yourself. Make sure that you are morally qualified to stone this woman to death. Make sure that there is no malice, no deceit, no trickery, no dishonesty, and especially make sure that you are not guilty of the same crime. He's reminding them that if they testify maliciously or deceitfully, they were signing their own death warrant before God. He wasn't forbidding judgment against adulterers, but he was requiring that these witnesses be morally qualified to make such a judgment. This is simply another version of Matthew chapter seven, verses one and two, where we learn that whatever standard we use to judge others, the same standard will be used to judge us. Or the words of Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount when he says, you hypocrites, take, first take the plank out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. This woman in this story looks a whole lot better than these teachers and Pharisees do at this point. 
These men were troubled by what Jesus said. They wanted to talk about the woman. Jesus wanted to talk about them. He did not say, let her be stoned, but rather let him who was without sin be the first to cast a stone at her. There's a huge difference in Jesus' mind between them and this woman. The issue for him isn't this woman's sin. It's her self-righteous and hypocritical accusers. They want to talk about the law as it relates to outward behavior. Jesus wants to talk about the law as it relates to the heart. Our Lord saw the woman's sin and he saw their hypocrisy. He saw their hearts and he saw her heart. And compared to them, she looked like a saint. In the end, there was more hope for her than for them. Having been caught in the act of adultery, she was closer to the kingdom of God than they were. She doesn't deny her sin, but they don't admit theirs. They were so convicted when Jesus spoke that they left one by one. Perhaps the oldest left first because they had more sins to account for. As someone has said, if the inner thoughts of a man were written on his forehead, he would never take his hat off. After the last one left, John tells us that Jesus straightened up and he asked her. He says, woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? No one, sir, she said. Then neither do I condemn you. Go now and leave your life of sin. Jesus, who searches the heart, forgave her, and then he sent her home to start a new life. You have committed adultery, he essentially is saying to her, but there is more to your life than this. You can be much more than you have been. You can turn from this sin once and for all. You can become a new creation. But there is more to this than a simple dismissal of the charges. When she answers, no one, sir, in the Greek, the word literally means no one, Lord. No one, Lord. She called him Lord. And when she refers to him as Lord, this is a statement of faith, brief though it may be. Now the reality is, is that all of us are like this woman. We are guilty in the eyes of a holy God, for we have all sinned and come short of the glory of God. And the wages of our sin, as our Bibles tell us, is death. That is spiritual death before God. But as it goes on, the grace of God is life. We can't buy our way out of our sins, nor can we deny our sinful condition. This is why the gospel message is so powerful. Just when we're about to be condemned, Jesus steps in to rescue us. I'm sure some people grumbled that day, feeling that, that her sin needed to be paid for. Little did they understand that it would be paid for on a Roman cross. And a few days later, Jesus didn't condemn this woman because he knew that in her heart she was repentant and that he would soon be dying on the cross for her sins and for the sins of all those who would turn to him. This is what Paul means when he says in Galatians chapter 3, verse 13, that Christ has become a curse for us. Our pain, our shame, our guilt, and our sins were laid on him. God's grace says to each one of us, go now, go now, and leave your life of sin. Let us pray. Father, once again, we thank you for 
this encounter that we have in our Bibles of Jesus, of this woman caught in the act of adultery, and of those who would like to just see her be stoned to death. We pray, Father, that we will not ever, ever be guilty of this kind of self-righteousness and this kind of judgmentalism, but that we might have the heart of Jesus, that we might be able to look into a person's heart and see where they're really at. Our Bible tells us that Jesus knows the heart of man something that only we wish we could do. So we help you, ask you, Father, to help us to be more conformed to the image of Jesus, especially as we see him in this particular story in our Bibles. Give you thanks in Christ's name. Amen.